Morning, good morning. Welcome to our live stream, folks. And here we are, Prophecy Update. And we do it monthly, and we do it for a reason. So that we don't forget, so that we don't start getting drowsy over how close it is. And we do it because there is power in the prayer. And I'll be the first to say it as the month goes from last prophecy to the next prophecy. I can find, almost find myself kind of going down a tad in the, like, the seriousness of it and the sharpness of it. Then every time I come into the window of now time to get ready for the next, and, and you're seeing me, I'm drawing this slope. I start seeing myself coming back up. That's right. These things are imminent. These things are right before us. Oh, my, I must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Oh, my, I need to pray for just what we read this morning in Revelation chapter 12. The Satan knows that his time is short. And... We do prophecy every month so that we can be reminded what he's being reminded of because he knows this prophecy better than us. And he knows his time is short and just what the Bible says is going to happen. He's going to go crazy in these last days. And so I need to go, if you would, in that craziness of I need to be a man of prayer. And I need to pray where needed. I need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I need to pray for a nation of his America that has gone greatly adrift and I need to pray for this war that's on. There's a war in heaven, but the outcome are these souls on earth. And I need to pray for these people because I go, I don't know how much breath I got and how much time I got. So I'm going to pray for them. Because the Lord says he doesn't want us to be unaware of his working with the nation of Israel. We do this over and over every month because a lot of people want to forget Israel. God just says, don't forget Israel. We just did a whole study, if you missed it this morning, on Israel means Israel. There is no replacement theology on this. God's not done with the nation of Israel. And yet people will go, I think God's done with Israel, so therefore, and then they get all twisted. No, I'm not done with the nation and the people of Israel. And when you look at the newspaper, this is why Satan is doing what he's doing against the nation of Israel. And therefore, the more, and the more aggressive he does Israel, the more imminent our redemption draws nigh. And he says, don't be unaware, 1 Corinthians 12, of spiritual gifts. Maybe it's not prophecy, if you would, but I need more Holy Spirit to love my wife, to do the dishes than I do to preach a sermon. I need the gifts of the Holy Spirit to be this hands and feet of the Lord. And then there's this gifts are gifts. Lord, give me the gifts you want for me to, to do what you've called me, all of us, in the days that we live. But then there's the fruit of the Spirit. Big difference from gifts and fruit. We've all been given the fruit. And as we soak and we just put ourselves be, before the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Well, I need that. And he says, that's fruit. It's not a gift. I expect you to bear fruit. Well, how do I bear fruit? John 15, you just need to be attached to the vine. How am I attached to the vine? Just be in my word. Just be in my presence. Just be in prayer. Just be in worship and these type of things. And so the gifts, Lord, what do you have for me? The fruit, Lord, just says be attached. And First um, Thessalonians 4, that's a prophetic piece. His second coming, the last days. He said, I don't want you to be unaware. I'm coming in these last days days and so he gives us what he's doing we study prophecy not so that we can go the world's out of control and everything's falling apart no because everything's falling right in place and he brings us a peace a priority a purity and a proof and a preach a peace that god's in control a priority that what's really important considering that I know revelation is starting to come into its fullness, uh, that we're the day. And then what's, uh, what I should be doing, I should be a spotless bride, present myself pure before him, as he says there in um, 1 John 3.3. 3. But I love it because it proves to me that the Bible is inspired. 
you can't make this up. You can't make up Israel. And it's been said, what is your greatest prophetic proof? It's Israel. They're still standing 2,000 years without a homeland. And then um, what do I do about all that we should preach the word in season and out of season? So we know what the sons of Ishakar, mighty men who came to David, and it says the sons of Ishakar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at their commandment. They knew that God was bringing the kingdom together. Saul's defeated. He's uniting David and the, all the 12 tribes. David, you're my king. And they saw it and they go, based on what God was doing, how do we respond to come alongside our king? You see the beautiful thing for us. We're seeing that God is bringing his kingdom together. And he says to us, you know the times and understanding of the times. And now we come to, well, how then should I respond to this? So uh, we become watchmen on the wall, Ezekiel 3. Son of man, I made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. We go through these uh, 14 flows. And you'll notice in the last couple, I've been trying to insert some deep dive specifics, probably things that I really don't want to go too deep dives on my revelation study, but things that I still find very interesting. And we, last time we did prophecy, we looked at um, the temple. Uh, before that, we did a deep dive on, well, what is anti-Semitism? That's pretty much what we covered this morning of Satan wants to destroy the remembrance of Israel so that he hopes he can stop um, the fulfillment of the of the time in Revelation. Well, today, uh, I'm going to have Paul, so you can get a different voice and a different view. We're going to talk about the Mahdi, the Muslim Antichrist. And it's fascinating, because some believe that the Antichrist will be of the Islamic thread. And so, um, fascinating. Many believe it. Um, I'll wait until we get there. So I'll hit some points, and then shortly here, and then probably in about five minutes, Paul should be ready, right, Paul? We're going to take a look at that. So our first point after the rapture is um, God puts the focus on Israel. And so, Father, I pray that you would just speak to our words. Lord, as iron sharpening iron, would this prophecy update sharpen us as we see that uh, what we should do as the sons of Ishakar and how we respond as we're watching you establish and bring in the kingdom and uh, all the kingdoms are becoming the kingdoms of the Lord as all the th flow of humanity is rushing to the throne uh, before heaven. And so, Lord, with the time that we got, make us sharp as steel and use us. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Can a nation be born in a day when we look at Israel, May 14th, 1948? Check. Um, just amazing. 2,000 years without a homeland. Um, I digress for a moment, but no, I don't. I absolutely 100% reject this statement and we did a little deep dive on it a few weeks a few prophecy updates ago i reject the statement palestine there is no palestine man-made so that they can put people in it and claim it to be theirs and one of the heirs that's made all that a palestinian is is a philistine no it's not i reject that Philistines are not Palestinians. Philistines were a nation. This is my point that I make. Philistine was a nation, five kingdoms, etc. as we study through that. Why do I reject that Palestine are Philistines? Because what does that do? It gives them the same thing that we say, Israel, the only one to survive 2,000 years without a homeland. Well, now you can come and say, well, the Philistines survived even longer. Therefore, they have a right to the land because the Philistines are the Palestinians. So may we disprove that, debunk that. And when people say such things, very politely say, actually, brother, sister, 
Palestine is not Philistines. There is no such thing as Palestine, and the Philistines were wiped out. They are not a nation that's, that exists anymore. You have your Arab nations, etc. But, so, nation born in a day. Um, man, hey, it's going to be awesome. Next prophecy update, we're going to have 10 foot. 10 foot screen. That's going to be amazing. We'll clear all this stuff, you know, out so you can get a full view because it's going to come down to here. And it's going to be awesome that those that are here can really, really see it. And it's going to come great on our high def camera as well. But um, these news clippings, I always pick news clippings from the last time we met. So they're new. I don't keep going back to old news because the prophecy is new every uh, new every morning, literally. But uh, speaking of that, and great is his faithfulness. Um, here's a report just came out. Between January 1st and May 15th this year, remember October 7th, the horrendous uh, attack on Israel, a holocaust before our very eyes, demonically inspired. This year, Israel welcomed 11,631 new immigrants with approximately 8,000, nearly 70% originating from Russia, according to an interim report by Alial, which is the call. Ezekiel 36, 37, God's going to regather Israel to the nation. And this former uh, Prime Minister Bennett, um, Naftali Bennett, tells the Rosenberg, uh, Joel Rosenberg, uh, just a, a great man. He's got threads through our Calvary Chapel network here. Israel's rebirth is fulfillment of Ezekiel 37 prophecies. It's time to get tough with Iran and two-state solution blew up in their face. And so even a former prime minister, this is Netanyahu, former prime saying what we're watching is this regathering, Ezekiel 36, 37, just what the Bible said would happen. And here's why. And we're watching it. Jewish people in Russia coming to the realization this is not the place to be a Jewish person. Jewish people all around the world are going, this is not the place to be a Jewish person. And as I move into these next pieces, it's happening here in America. Many of the Jewish people are saying, this is no longer the place for me to be. The United States is no longer a place for me to be Jewish. The ones in France, the one in around the world, this is no longer safe to be a Jewish person anywhere except one place, Israel. And then what we see with the strength of Israel saying, we are not going to bow to the pressures, and this is what the pressures are as we look at Zechariah 12, um, 3. Israel will be a stumbling block, a cup of trembling to all the nations. Um, you go to school here in America. You go to work. Everybody probably going to go to work tomorrow or, or Tuesday, holiday. And we, you hear it over and over and over Diversity, equity, inclusion. If you're going to work here, if you're going to go to school here, regardless of your age, diversity, equity, inclusion. And everybody gets diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're watching a time like no other time, except if you're Jewish. They will allow on these school campuses. You see Northwestern cuts a deal with encampment organizations organizers establishing full ride scholarship for Palestinian students. So we're going to shut down the whole school. We're going to encamp against the whole school. We're going to claim and cry free Palestine. And so the only way the school can get them to clear and put normalcy back to the campus is go, how about if we give scholarships to these, though I don't, I'm just reading the article, the Palestinians, the ones in Gaza. And then they go, yes, we, we've made our achievement that they come back. Columbia University succumbs to mob, cancels graduation ceremony. You go to school for four years, Columbia University, I'm just going to guess that's $40,000 a year. I just spent $160,000. It's my turn to walk. 
and I don't get to graduate because there's a encampment against Israel, free Palestine. Most of them don't even know what it means when you ask them what's happening. But you got all this pressure of the world. I say diversity, equity, inclusion. Notice it's a DEI because they spelled it the other way before. And then they came to the realization, ah, don't spell it D-I-E. Because people really go, die. That's the word die. And that's what this diversity, inclusion, and equity is. It's killing our people as one together. It's killing these true diversity, equity, diversity, inclusion, equity. It's killing it because it is coming with its own bias. And we'll talk more about that before we finish here today. But Israel won't succumb to it. Even when the United States says, if you go into Hamas, you go into Gaza to destroy Hamas, and it doesn't come out and say, and I know I say it with an attitude, hey, listen, if you go into Gaza and you seek out the terrorist group Hamas to destroy them, the ones who came October 7th and murdered 1,200 people, you know, 50 people have committed suicide who were at that Nova Festival, music festival. 50 Jewish guys and gals have committed suicide since that day because they can't live in peace. You can't sleep thinking that someone's going to bust in. You can't sleep. Not all the women that were raped went in as hostages. Some of them were just raped and left. And they live with brutality. He's going to bust in. And here's what the United States is saying. Look, you go in and you're going to deal with these people who raped your women and killed your children. We're not going to give you the weaponry. And here's the amazing thing to me, just to the American. We're not going to give you JDAMs. You know what JDAM stands for? Joint Direct Attack Munition. We, with a JDAM electronic in front of you, with GPS locating, turns that little uh, $10,000 bomb into like a $200,000 bomb with the nose kit on it. But it can strike within three feet of precision. Now you just take a dumb bomb, you launch it, it probably falls within 100 feet. It's still got fins on it and whatnot. It, it'll fall with 100 feet. We've had... Some of them just totally missed by several hundred feet. So we're not going to give you direct munition that can pinpoint and strike where the terrorist tunnel is. We're going to withhold that because we don't want you to use it against, it's going to hurt the people. So instead, drop your dumb bombs that could possibly miss by several, you know, dozen feet or whatever. It's just the l lunacy of these type of things that the United States does, but it's a betrayal in that it's forcing, we will not let you finish this fight, even though we finished the fight against Adolf Hitler. We did not stop until it was done, but we're telling you, you can't do it. And you just think of these things. It goes back to this morning's message. So not to reteach the whole message. It's demonically infused delusion. That Satan has taken unregenerated minds. But I watch that he's working within the church now. Because even the church will go. Israel doesn't deserve the land. And this is my position on Israel. It's God's gave them the land. And it's between them and God. It's not for me to determine anything more, and that's your land. What you do with it, it's up to you. You want to give it away, you give it away. You want to fight for it, you want to fight for it. But I know that as Americans, when 9-11 happened, we knew, and President Bush said it so well, you can come to justice, or justice is coming to you. We gave the opportunity for the Afghani government to give up Osama bin Laden, and they didn't. They harbored him. And so all the deaths that happened in Afghanistan were a result in that a government wouldn't give up the people who fueled this attack. And that's what we, we have here. 
Israel is going in to deal with, if we don't settle this, they will just keep coming back and coming back and coming back. If we don't destroy this tunnels and the system, they'll just keep building and building and building more weapons of destruction that come against us. So here's the delusion of it all. Uh, Spain, Norway, and Ireland will recognize a Palestinian state. What? You don't own the property? What? I, who gives you the right to say we're going to give you a two-state solution? And here, Israel and U.S. fume as U.N. votes to elevate Palestinian status. So here's what the world's saying, and I know I'm, I got an attitude about it. it. It sounds like that, but God is not in favor of these things. God's word is clear as can, as can be on these type of things. It's Israel's land. It's not for us to divide it up. In fact, Joel 3 gives a warning you divide up my land, I'm going to divide you up, the Lord says. So be warned, United States of America, Europe, uh, Ireland, Spain, Ireland, Spain, and Norway. But go in, do your horrendous butchery, and here's what your consequence is. We're going to give you a two-state solution. Rape, murder, and here's, here's how we think it can end. If we give you a two-state solution, they've had a two-state solution. That's the thing. They've had the two-state solution. They had a golden paradise that could have turned into the next Tel Aviv. They had more of a two-state solution until 67, 1967, when they go, we're not satisfied with this two-state solution. We want to totally one-state solution and destroy Israel and all of it. That's why the land has been shrunk on them 83 i believe it is happens again and here we are in these things they don't want a two-state solution because it's demonically fused and fueled to go and destroy israel because the devil does not want israel to be in place so that jesus book of revelation can finish this off and come into its fruition and he thinks if i can delay it or absolutely defeat it then there is no end and this goes on forever and i think that's why john wept when he the title deed came he wept because he thought if no one takes this title deed to the earth that we see in in revelation chapter five he weeps because it just means then this world just keeps going on and on i gotta tell you i think you're you're with me on this i could not bear to see another october 7th and I could not bear if such a horrendous thing happened in my own country to my own countrymen because of the infusion of this demonic. My heart just can't bear anymore. And I say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. So the European super state. Revelation 13, Daniel 7, there's going to come a revived Roman Empire. Out of it's going to come a man of peace, so-called. We all call him the Antichrist. He's going to make a seven-year peace deal with Israel. And um, many think he'll use that rebuilding of the temple as a peace that Israel will agree to. Uh, that's a, it's not said clearly in the scriptures but it could be but um here's a man of peace and here's what the world continually tries u.s and saudi arabia semi-final security agreement could pay the way pave the way for normalization with israel so what it says here normalization i'll trade with you you trade with me we can fly planes in and out we can build our economies we're not going to fight we're not going to kill each other and so saudi arabia said we'll do that with you and israel wants to do that but then some believe as you, if i was to read on the article that it comes and says well here's what saudi arabia is going to do in order for us to do that because we're talking trillions we're talking an economic explosion and they're in a prime place to do it because how much money does israel blow and spend blow through to to fund this war right factories aren't building stuff guys are in the war and all these type of things and so trillions and trillions of economic ex boom is is being presented and then they say united states and saudi arabia if you give a two-state solution, we're in. And Israel could be financially forced in, you know what, this could be worth it just for the economic boom. 
So, so many pieces as we look at these things, and it's us before our very eyes. But I just want to give you a, a piece of this, and this is, um, it's called the Mahdi, the satanic counterfeit to fool the world, that this Mahdi, he's the Muslim Messiah. They're waiting, Islam is waiting for a Messiah. And they think the Messiah is going to come and establish an everlasting Islamic kingdom religion on this world. And so to give you a, a flip side, a direct, uh, a different approach to the presentation, I'm going to have Paul come and share with that. You got your mic? Good now? Okay, cool. Sorry, I think I hit the wrong button. All right, so we're going to talk about the Mahdi. He's a uh, sort of messianic figure within Islamic eschatology. We're going to specifically talk about the Shia version of that. You'll understand why in a bit. Uh, you don't have to read all of this. This is kind of here for your reference. You can go through it later at your will. I was tempted to do a sort of history of Islam and kind of how we got here. Realized I was probably not going to be the most cogent way of explaining this. Instead, I've got to hear the six sort of major denominations within Islam. The majority of you know followers of Islam are going to fall into the Sunni branch of Islam, about 80 to, to 90 percent. They believe that Muhammad did not appoint a successor to him, but Abu Bakr was the one who ultimately did sort of take the reins from that. He was a father-in-law. Shia, which is usually what you'll see out of Iran and the numerous other proxies that they've got, um, they believe that he did choose a successor, that it was uh, Ali ibn Ali Tabib, which was basically his son-in-law, and they go from there. One of the main differences between these two is that the imams in Sunni Islam are sort of just prayer leaders, nothing more, but in uh, Shia Islam, they're seen sort of as a, a more literal representation of Allah on earth. That, that's kind of how they are, are viewed and seen. Uh, the Ibadi, they are a sort of unique branch of Islam. They're really only seen in uh, Oman, one of the interesting things about that from a geopolitical perspective is it makes Oman rather neutral within the Middle East as a whole. They're kind of the, the Switzerland out there. Because of that, the United States and other um, sort of outside actors use them a lot to negotiate things. So, for example, in 2015, when we wanted to negotiate out a nuclear deal with Iran, we went through Oman because they have functionally good relations with everyone because they follow a, a different brand of Islam than everyone else. Um, I'm just going to put up their Wahhabism that really came in in the 17th century. It's very popular in a lot of the rural areas of um, uh, Saudi Arabia. This is really where we get um, a lot of the very fundamental ideas within Islam. They are very, you know, back to the basics. If they were a Christian denomination, they would be Calvary Chapel. They take the Quran very literally, very seriously, and they act out exactly what it says. So, you know, Osama bin Laden, that's kind of where that comes from. Osama's a lot more complicated than that, but just for our purposes. Okay, so let's talk about some Islamic eschatology. So in Islam, they acknowledge that Jesus was a prophet. They call him Isa. They believe that he is one day going to return, specifically east of Damascus, and he's going to help this character called the Mahdi basically establish an Islamic state across the entire earth, an Islamic caliphate. The Mahdi means the guided one. He is the one who is actually going to create that final global state that is under Islam. He is seen sort of as the final and ultimate successor to Muhammad. So everything that Muhammad started in kind of the 7th century, that's going to be fulfilled here. It's interesting that a lot of the Islamic scholars, when they are reading through the Bible, and specifically Revelation, they will identify Mahdi as the white rider in the book of Revelation. I've got a couple up there that will um, do that. 
I will note, I'm not going to make a huge deal about this, but I've seen a couple of scholars talk about them. If you look at the colors of the horses in Revelation, you've got white, you've got red, you've got uh, black, and you've got green. Those are the colors traditionally associated with Islam. Now, that is interesting. I wouldn't make a huge deal about that. Um, it's always dangerous, particularly in prophecy, to sort of extrapolate large conclusions from single pieces of data, but it is worth cons- considering. Anyway, Mahdi is going to reign. He's specifically going to reign at Jerusalem for seven years. At that point, the final battle will come, and they have the idea of Gog and Magog in Shura 18, where they call them uh, Yajuj and Majuj. So Gog and Magog is going to come down, great final battle, and then everything is over and the judgment day comes in. Now, who is the Mahdi? If you are a Sunni, you just see him as just kind of some normal guy that's going to come and, and do all of this. If you are Shia, specifically what's known as a, a Twelver Shia, you think that he is basically the second coming of a guy named Muhammad Ibn Hassan al-Mahdi, who was born in 869. When he was five years old, he was made imam, specifically the 12th imam. Within their idea, he has now been hidden from the world or occulted from the world, and he is now going to be revealed at the end times. And when he is revealed, he's going to sort of usher in all of these things. That is the, the idea that they, that they hold to. He is basically going to establish a, a violent, militaristic, worldwide Islamic caliphate. Everyone who is a Christian or a Jew or who does not convert to Islam will be murdered. He is going to reign from Jerusalem specifically for seven years. Uh, and in the Hadith, which is sort of the sayings and commentaries on the Quran from uh, Muhammad, they say that he's specifically going to make a covenant with the Romans, which they identify as Europe. Um, side note, um, the Byzantine Empire, that's a stupid term that doesn't exist. They didn't call themselves that. They called themselves the Romans. Uh, Rome didn't fall in the 5th century. It fell in the 15th century. All right, back on track. Some other things that's going to happen during this time. Um they believe that the Mahdi is going to recover the original book of Psalms, which is in the Sea of Galilee, for reasons, I guess. Uh, and they also think that the Torah, the original gospel that was obviously not co- corrupted by people like Paul, the Ark of the Covenant, the original tablets and staff of Moses, and the Ring of Solomon are hidden in a cave in Antioch, and all of that's going to be recovered. Again, for reasons. Uh, a couple months ago, or a couple weeks ago, I think, uh, Pastor was talking about some of the ideas with the Ark of the Covenant and where we potentially think it might be. Well, they think it's in a cave near Antioch. Because. Um, I've got a quote down here from uh, one of the scholars that's actually quoted in the Hadith. It says, If you see him, go to him and give him your allegiance, even if you have to crawl over ice, because he is the caliphate of Allah, the Mahdi. So basically, when he comes, you will give absolute total allegiance to him. So I want to talk about the nature of the Antichrist. Uh, Number one, when I am personally discussing this topic, I do not use the term Antichrist. Um, He is given 33 titles in the Old Testament, and he's given 13 titles in the New, not one of them is Antichrist. We conflate that because of a comment that John makes in 1 John, where he's talking about Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist. But he does not use that term in Revelation 13. It seems to me that if he wanted to use that term, he was fully capable of using that term, but he didn't, so I'm not going to do that either. In fact, I'm going to refer to him as either the first beast or the second beast. And that's the second thing we need to understand, is in Revelation 13, that scenario that God has laid out, there are two people, not one. We, we tend to conflate that again, and that leads to other issues, particularly when we are trying to interpret the Old Testament. For example, is the Antichrist going to be a Jew or a Gentile? It turns out that's actually a huge problem, because you would have to imagine that he would be a Jew in order to get all of the Jews to come and take him as Messiah, and yet you'd also have to imagine he would be a Gentile in order for the rest of the Gentile world to follow him. You can look at Malachi 5 as an example, where it says he does, in fact, need to be a Gentile. And you can look at Revelation, um, sorry, just the whole history of um, Judaism to realize that he has to be a Jew. But the problem kind of goes away when you realize that there's actually two people involved there. Now, in Revelation 13, we have what a lot of scholars like to refer to as a satanic trinity. You've got the dragon, which Pastor Ray spent the last hour discussing, You've got the first beast, the beast that comes out of the sea, and you've got the second beast, the beast that comes out of the earth. 
I'm going to submit to you the following sort of uh, analogy, and you can do with it what you will. Obviously, Satan is the dragon. I don't think we're terribly confused on that point. If you're confused on that point, see Pastor Ray. I'm certain he'll talk your ear off about that. Um, I'm going to submit to you that within sort of Islamic eschatology, whether they realize it or not, their Mahdi is the first beast. He is the one that is pretending to be Jesus. He is a Gentile. He is specifically going to make a covenant with Europe, for lack of a better term. He's going to rule for seven years from Jerusalem, just like the Antichrist. He's going to persecute Jews and Christians, and he's going to establish a global empire under himself and under his own sort of religious system. The second beast, Isa, is what they're going to call Jesus, but isn't. And he's going to basically act in the place of the Holy Spirit. He's going to be that prophet that points to everything else. And it's worth noting that even in Islam, Jesus is seen as a prophet. He is the one who is actually specifically going to mediate that covenant. If you read the Hadith, it's interesting. The Mahdi does not actually mediate that covenant. It is actually done by someone who is a Jew or specifically a descendant of Aaron and of the priest of Aaron. He is the one that actually mediates that covenant, not the Mahdi himself. So, yeah, that's the scenario I lay out. I think it's really interesting that even within their own eschatology, it lines up very well with um, what we see in Revelation 13, but obviously in sort of a a twisted and deceived version. Um, I've got a quote up here from the Ayatollah of Iran. Uh, Quick side note, that's not the guy that just died. That was uh, the president of Iran. This is a completely different person. This is the supreme leader of Iran. Um, I got this quote directly from the office of the supreme leader of iran this was not something that i got from any sort of you know media outlet christian or otherwise i like to get it from the direct source as possible when i'm going through his quote and the way he talks about the mahdi i want you to imagine that this is pastor ray talking all right injustice poverty disease decadence sins deep rifts between the classes and the misuse of science by world powers have caused the human community to feel exhausted anxious and trouble and the feeling of a need of a saving hand throughout the world has reached its peak and has proven up until today that science and wisdom cannot untie the knot of injustice the fulfillment of this continual dream requires the hand of divine power It is for this reason that the great mission of the imam of the age is to fill the earth with justice. Awaiting the imam in Islam is a constructive anticipation which is accompanied by hope, movement, and action. Of course, awaiting the reappearance and relief must be reflected in all affairs of life. For it is this reason that awaiting is a relief in itself because it saves humans from despair and hopelessness. Awaiting does not mean sitting idly, taking no action, and waiting for something to happen. It means preparing and being active to achieve that bright, promised future. Awaiting the imam also means the coming of relief and salvation after difficulty. Therefore, those who are awaiting the imam do not become disappointed and anxious due to these events, and they know that the situation will surely change. I think you'd get along really well with uh, the Ayatollah over there. (laughs) Um, I'll just make a a quick side note. Uh, One of the things that the foreign policy of the United States often gets wrong is they fail to really understand the, the motivations behind a lot of what they do, and it's because they don't understand their eschatology. When you realize that when he's talking about action and the actions that they often take, it really is a, a violent thing because they believe that by taking out Israel, they are going to create the conditions necessary for the return of the Mahdi. When you understand that, when you understand their proxies with Hamas and the Houthis and whatever else they may have, and you understand that from a functional perspective, they are an apocalyptic death cult bent on bringing about the end of the world, you start to understand why they do what they do. And until you understand that, it's going to be very difficult to understand their actual foreign policy. All right, so some quick books and reading up here if you want to do anything further. A Woman Rides the Beast, it's very good. I agree with like 95% of the stuff that's in it. He's got a couple things that are a little weird, but really good. Um, Hal Lindsey, he's got several good books. I'm just going to put up there uh, The Everlasting Hatred and the Roots of Jihad. It's a good one. Um, an interesting one up there, Myth and Mystery by Jack Finnegan. I'm going to not attempt to prove this point here, but I'll let you do your own study. 
when we look at traditional pagan religions prior to the appearance of Jesus Christ, we realize that they are all functionally anticipating Jesus Christ in some form, generally some kind of twisted and, and perverse form. After the appearance of Jesus, I would argue that all of those religions that have come are now anticipating his second appearing. We saw Islam as an example of that. You can see the same thing with uh, Krishna or the fifth Buddha as other examples where they are anticipating a similar messianic figure. If you want to go through that book and come to your own conclusions, you're welcome to do that. Um, yeah, I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Ray and he'll finish you out. So I think you see the devil understands the book of Revelation. You see the mirroring, the mimicking, and anti means instead of. We look at him, he is anti, complete opposite of, but truly that the word is instead of. And um, we see how it's going to be instead of. We read what we know is the truth, but they present and paint this picture instead of. So he has this devil, he has this answer for all these things he's going to have an answer for the rapture whatever that may be aliens and the like he's going to have an answer for the man of peace who so-called comes to make these peace agreements for seven years and the like and it's all going to keep going back to remember this is what we said in the quran remember this is what our uh, eschatology says in islam and so there will be this large group of people that will go along with it this is exactly what our religion has said. So they're waiting for the same things that we're waiting for, except in a dis destructive, decisive way. One of the things Paul said, and um, it's ever so fitting, and there's a group of them that believe that order can only come out of the chaos. So you need a world of chaos. And I could go on and on. I want to spend some time just hearing uh, some of the things you've been reading, thinking, take some question and answers. And so... Um, but just for your understanding as you, what you just heard here in Paul's presentation of that and my study in Revelation 12 this morning is Hamas does not want a two-state solution because in their mind that would bring peace. And so if there's a peace, there's no chaos if there's no chaos, there's no hastening the return of their Mahdi, their instead of Christ that comes. So fascinating as we look at these things. I'm thankful for what we do here. We study these things. Uh, you get a double blessing. I pray double blessings for you that you stay for what we call our third service on the last Sunday of the month. Because, you know, there's things like this. I really want to stay just solid on this is what the Word of God says, and I just want to teach the Bible. But there are these other things that we really need to understand to really understand what's going on in the world. And one of the things, an Islamic antichrist, uh, Mahdi, the um, the the mirror and the Im, uh, fake. Paul made the statement of um, Osama bin Laden, you know, his version of Islam would be our version of Calvary Chapel. And what that is, is we call them extremists. They're not. Terrorism, what happened October 7th, what we've seen through... They're not extremists. They're fundamentalists. Just as we are. Not, I don't want to make Calvary Chapel a, a movement or whatever. But we come here as we gather together. Because we believe that the word of God is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. We're fundamentalists. And so in the vein of Islam, there's fundamentalists who believe that the Quran is the word of God. So when they strike terror attacks, when they kill and they do all these type of things, it is not because they're extremists. They're fundamentalists, just as we are. We believe this is the word of God. They believe what they're reading is literally the word of God. And if it says go to kill Jews, go and kill uh, the Christians, they do it. And we know it's true because we watched it.
And we watched them fly planes into buildings right here on our own soil. And we watched them fly uh, winged vehicles and crash fences October 7th. So um, fascinating. And just to weave through a couple pieces of staying on all of our points, wanted to deep dive that. I think a great piece of information for us as we say, why are they the way that they are? Well, we just got a great 15-minute uh, clip on why they are the way that they are as we look at Islam. But may I say this, there's just a whole bunch of people who they, they say, um, I follow Islam, uh, I'm Muslim. They don't read the Quran. They don't care what the Quran, just like many people say, I go to church, I'm a Christian. They don't know what the Bible says. They don't follow the Bible. They just go on Sunday and then they do what they want the rest of the day as well. That's, we call them secular. Uh, I know many of you, and I've said this before, um, Amir Safadi, uh, pretty well known with his, he's a Jewish man, Christian believer, puts out a bunch of this is what's going on in Israel that you might not know of. I walked with him two weeks after September 11th happened here, and I said, what do you think of these things? And I, many of you heard this, and he goes, well, you get to live now how we live, every day not knowing what's coming that the that the evil is out there just waiting for their opportunity but he made that point clear to me of there's islamic people they just go to church on whatever you know they go to their mosque on the day that they go to their mosque and they hear what what's being said they don't care what's being said and they go home and they just went on and go live on life and that's what we see Secular Christians, eh, yeah, I believe, but I'm not going to live it. I'm not going to sacrifice. But then there's the fundamentalists. And that's what we just read and studied, that there's fundamentalists. And they fundamentally believe the Quran says this, and therefore they fundamentally do what it says. So with that, keep that in mind. Uh, that tape's reserved, preserved. You can go back and watch these things. Uh, the notes or the slides you saw are all uh, attached to this um, video when we uh, put it up there as an archive so you can go back and look at all these slides well I'm just going to hit these points because again I want to spend time and uh, respect your time well next is earthquake famine pestilence war Matthew 24 lawlessness will abound well here we are this war in um, Russia Ukraine just keeps going isn't it interesting I don't have a slide but um I think it was yesterday or the day before, Russia launched a drone strike on a hardware store in Ukraine, Kirkov, I believe. Why isn't anybody screaming about that as protecting civilians? The world says nothing. Oh, well, it's just part of war. It happens. Israel, you know, they anything happens they want to go and say you stop your your bombing and these type of things and so if israel does it the world is upheaval and comes against them russia does it all day no one says anything because it's demonic the hatred is demonically infused by the devil against israel because he wants to stop the prophetic clock and what happened there two thousand years ago that god came down and gave himself as a sacrifice the greatest war, and may we never forget it. That's why we do this month after month, so we don't forget it. So we remember, church, to pray for the greatest war on the planet. It's in the womb. It's 60 million babies here in America. And um, worldwide, there's like 42 million a year. I make this point of uh, we have come to a place for this next election coming up there will be no candidate that's going to stand for the life that's in the womb. We've come, and this is what's sad for the United States of America, is what we've come to is there's no candidate that feels that he can win the election if he takes a hard pro-life stance. We watch President Trump, oh, Roe versus Wade, watch him. He's pulled himself back that he doesn't want to come and defend that anymore. And Larry Hogan ran last week as a Republican won the Republican seat to go against the Democrat come November. Then two, three days later, after he won against, then he comes out and says, um, I'm in support. Larry Hogan comes out in support of abortion access in the latest appeal to Democratic vote. He waits till he wins, defeats his 
Republican who stood for pro-life, now he comes out two days later and going, well, but no, I'm not going to be pro-life like that. And so he wants to run on, I'm going to protect the border and I'm going to do it. all good stuff. What's, what am I saying? It's just sad that the United States of America can't come to the place of going, who's going to speak for the widow and the orphan? These children are fatherless. They're orphans because they have no mother or father who's willing to fight for them. And I won't stop. We won't stop. We will pray that God will do something. I don't know how it is, but here's what I know. We as a church, we can do one. So we can at least do one. And if anyone hears my voice and you're thinking about it, we can do something. We can help you. You come and see us and we will stand with you and walk with you until you are delivered through this. And as I always say, Satan loves as I will, and he likes to come and say, how can you? And if you've had an abortion, Satan jumping on you and trying to steal, kill, and destroy your joy, the blood of Jesus covers that. There's no unpardonable sin except the rejection of the sacrifice, what Jesus did on the cross. God loves you, and he's not going to cast you away, and he can what was meant for evil he can turn into good not that anyone today should go well god can turn this into good therefore i shall go no stop now but if you've been there god will forgive you but what i say to anyone who's thinking about it is you go talk to any woman who's walking with jesus who's been there they will tell you it still haunts them and therefore what god's speaking to you is it will haunt you for the rest of your life so therefore, don't, because then you can be free of that. So the greatest war. Well, there's going to be a one-world government, a one-world religion, false prophet, the second beast Paul was mentioning. We see that through Revelation 13. And um, we see all these pieces today. I'm only going to, I'm just going to fire through these things for the next several minutes so we can... Um, have your, your time together. But Egypt, UAE, Morocco said, Wayne, U.S. plan to create a post-war Gaza peacekeeping force. Um, technically, it's still Israel's territory. And, but here the world says, we're going to tell you how to do the post-war, uh, how Gaza is going to be handled. I'll tell you what, if I'm Israel, I trust you, America, as far as I can throw you. Because you're going to do, any, every, you're showing us in the middle of war how you're protecting. And I'm going to trust you. There's going to be more tunnels built and more, you know, destruction to come. And who can um, live through those things. But hey, just let you know, you know, they love to put fear. The World Health Organization wants to tell everybody, look out, here comes bird flu. And... It will be a constant thing. One world government is how to handle the next pandemic. And I put an article up here. Slovakia will not support a new pandemic treaty. Keep your eye on this. We talk about it often. But the World Health Organization, governments want to come and say, when in the next pandemic like COVID hits, whatever the World Health Organization says, we'll do. The United States of America, President Biden's actually considering this. It's a continual battle down with the Republican, even some of the Democrat uh, congressmen saying, no, no, we do not give up our sovereignty. No other nation tells us what we're going to do. And yet we have leadership that goes, you tell us what to do, we'll do it. Tell us to shut down, we'll shut down. Tell us to take shots, we'll take shots. Tell us to breathe this and sneeze that, whatever it may be. And... Um, Fifth point, iniquity and sin will abound. Second Timothy, the rise in uh, sin abounding. Well, here in Maryland, the largest school district, that's Montgomery County, a couple over, uh, doesn't have to allow opt-out of LGBT teaching in the court. So your kid goes to school over there, they're going to teach LGBT, and uh, you can't opt out. Your kid will go. If he doesn't, he fails. Uh, San Francisco. You know, the only place I know legislates and then even sells sorcery because that's what the word pharmakia um, means. It means sorcery there in the works of the flesh. San Francisco spending $5 million per year giving regimented doses of alcohol to homeless addicts. You know what it is? I'm going to keep you drunk so you'll just be quiet 
And that's what this is. Same with methadone and all those type of things. We legislate sorcery in this country. Amazing. We've legislated uh, marijuana, cannabis, so that we can keep people dummy d- down and numbed. Um, apostasy, the great deception. Someone's going to depart from the faith. We see false teachers are going to rise and there's going to be, and maybe you're feeling it. You guys are crazy. You talk about this rapture and the second coming of Christ. That's insane. Well, just as we expected, um, I almost, it's good that I wasn't there, (laughs) right? Anyway, United Methodist drops decade-old ban on ordaining LGBT clergy without debate. United Methodist Church lifts 40-year ban on LGBT. And so here's a representation, so-called, John Wesley would, the Methodist, the man was mighty, he he was part of the great, uh, you know, the great uh, revival that happened through America, the great awakening. And this is what's happened to his denomination. And I say, as we as Calvary Chapel, we're not in a dom- denomination, but we're a brotherhood uh, of churches that we believe the same thing. The Bible's the word of God. Well, I say, man, it's important for us to make sure that the next generation, should the Lord tarry, they stick to these same things. This is what the word of God says. Don't go by the cultural pressure. And I look at these two men. I go, you're crying? You're crying over of tears of joy that this, this would be tears of shame. That you could take the word of God and go, well, it doesn't mean that. Because what you do is you sentence these people to, it's okay. God understands you were made that way or whatever. You need a savior to be freed from that. And so once again, paucity, sin, you know, God can set you free. No one has to be bound to whatever it is, whether it's drugs, alcohol, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. God has the power and he wants to move us and change us to become from glory to greater glory. Well, um, there's going to be some excuse the United States has an all-domain anomaly resolution office. It used to be called UFO, but that's, you know, that's crazy talk. So we'll rename it because they have to somehow come up with what's going to happen when the rapture happens. Knowledge will increase in these last days. We know Daniel chapter 12 to see the two witnesses on the wall, just to tie this whole world together. Revelation 11, as we see those type of things, um, Artificial intelligence, continual rise of the continual discussion. But this article is great. Um, Can we rid artificial intelligence of bias? What's the point of its program? It's not as free reigning as people think it is. Someone, there's a human in the loop and they put in of when it, this results come in, make the programming go here. So you can see the bias is going to be against the word of God. So make the bias of, hey, if they want to ask, you know, what does God think about LGBTQ? Make it biased. Don't go to the Bible. Don't go to 1 Corinthians 6. Go to the United Methodist vote. Go to and spend. There's a true bias behind it. It is anything but um, open. So. The Magog invasion, I talked about that this morning. I thought it was fascinating. Um, We know it's Russia, Iran, Turkey, all together. The point I make is, you know when disaster happens, who comes rushing to your aid really shows who's your greatest allies. And when President of Iran went down in that crash last month, first two nations that ran to them was Russia and Turkey. I see how that comes together, and it was sad as a world, the moment, you know, the United Nations gave him a moment of silence. He is the butcher of Iran, just as Saddam Hussein was the butcher of Baghdad. He was a murderous, ruthless, brutal man. He was, with the Ayatollah behind just what we studied with uh, Paul's presentation this morning, of October 7th. That was their money. That was their funding. That was their proxy war. He's a ruthless, demonic man. And i sorry for a soul that perishes, but when you talk about a man who is wicked, 
this is one of the most wicked men in the world. And the Ayatollah. Sadly, though, here's what's going to happen. Um, the next Iranian president will be no better. Because he will be appointed by the Ayatollah. What we just studied, the Mahdi. They don't want peace. They don't want a two-state solution. They don't want, let's live together. They want chaos. So, and Russia's got an awesome sub, by the way. All right. Rebuild Temple, we talked about that. Um, I, I, I made these clips because we're t you keep hearing about a red heifer. It's used for purity. And people can go, we don't really need a red heifer. Is this really? The point is, it's 2,000 years later from the destruction of the temple. And we're actually in the day talking about what's need to be needed for a rebuilt temple. That's to me. This is this week's article, this month's article of people are talking about rebuilding the temple. And we studied in Revelation 11, it will be rebuilt. Where's America? No passage of scripture. I pray for America and that um, here's what I believe America is going to do. Said it soon as it happened several months ago. Anyway, but Netanyahu, America is going to force Israel to remove Netanyahu because he's a war hawk and he will not stop pursuing the wickedness that's coming. So America going to want him removed because that's how they're going to get peace. And this guy here is influenced the, um, he's on the cabinet. If this guy Gantz, um, defense minister, I believe if he leaves the coalition of the government, it goes back into remember what we went through all these votes and you won't have a unite, unified Israel anymore. So America, be on guard. Um, Mark of the Beast, our 11th point. Wave the hand and walk out with it it's before our very eyes. Um, some interesting articles of the digital ID and stuff. This Babylon will be rebuilt because Satan, Satan got to finish what he started there in Babylon. The Battle of Armageddon, uh, we talked about that of in the last days that the kings of the east and south come to fight uh, against the Antichrist forces. And then Jesus returns with us and um, they'll turn their hatred towards one another, towards a greater hatred towards God and then God in the voice. And that's the power that he has. In the voice, it's over. I put this up here because our FBI, just so you know, our FBI... And if you watch the movement of our defense spending and the movement of our forces, so I just put this out there for you, where we're moving our forces as a nation, where we're gathering up our intelligence, and FBI will speak it, that the greatest threat to America is China. Not Russia, not Hamas, not what's going on in the Middle East. Everything is focusing that China is the greatest threat. And we're preparing for that. They, uh, China did a demonstration of attacking Taiwan, which they, some think, will bring America into a battle with them. But the point that I make is we're watching in the Revelation that even our government says China will rise and be a great. The kings of the East are on the rise, and we need to be ready for that. So the good news is, just like at the end of that battle, our God wins. Amen? So, Father, I bless you, and I thank you for the word that you gave us and the time. Lord, you make an iron sharpening iron. Like the sons of Ishakar, so it is that we see the signs of the time so that we might know what to do for a unified king that's coming together, not David this time, but the seed of David, our Jesus Christ. So, Lord, speak to us what these things mean. And, Lord, just keep us sharp. We will not rest. We will not slumber. And we will not be found like the five of those virgins without oil in our lamp. We're going to be waiting because we know our king coming for us. You're going to take us. And so with the time that we have if Satan knows it's short, then so too should we. Let us do something about it, I pray in your name. 